I did my PhD at Harvard University and afterwards on, was on the faculty. And we actually did research looking at the relationship between music and the brain. And we were interested in, in testing the hypothesis that when people sing, what they're doing is at least two things. Number one, they're using words, which is more left hemispheric, but they're also doing melody and intonation, which is using the right hemisphere. So we recorded EEG from both sides of the brain, and we had three conditions. We had people speaking the lyrics to a song in a monotone, which would be relative left hemisphere. We had whistling the melody to the song, which would be relative right hemisphere. And then we had singing the song, which should supposedly involve both hemispheres. And what we discovered was that when people were saying the lyrics, it was relative left hemisphere. When they were whistling, it was relative right hemisphere. But when they were singing, it activated both sides of the brain. And we published that research in one of the mainstream psychology journals. For 12 years, I was a professor at Yale University of Psychology and Psychiatry and directed the Yale Psychophysiology Center. And while I was there, a graduate student and I did some research to see what the effects of music, listening to music while they were under anesthesia in a one-day surgery situation, whether this would have an effect of reducing the experience of pain, reducing the need for pain medication, and also increasing recovery from the anesthesia. So we had two groups of subjects, one who selected music and wore headphones listening to the music while they were in surgery. And we had a control group of people who had headphones on, but there was no music. And what we discovered was that the, uh, the people who had music during surgery actually reported less pain and used less pain medication and recovered more quickly from the anesthesia, which again was suggesting to me that music could have effects that would be applicable to the uh, healthcare situation. When I moved to the University of Arizona, I had the opportunity to return to doing research on music. And it began because a woman who had a PhD in optical sciences, Dr. Kathy Kreth, decided to do a second PhD in the area of music. And she came to me wishing to integrate her interests in science and music and healing. She asked my advice, and I suggested, given that set of interests, that she might consider wanting to do research on the effects of music on the germination of seeds. Because although there had been many claims that music could affect plants, there had been really no controlled or systematic research. And uh, Kathy went to her committee, and they approved this kind of research, and so we did a series of experiments. And we tested to see whether a beautiful flute music played to both okra seeds and zucchini seeds as they were germinating, whether or not it would have an effect on increasing the rate of germination compared to either no music or to random sounds like white noise, which were similar to the frequencies of the music. And in five separate experiments, what we found was that sure enough, it was the music, not no sound and not just noise per se, that actually facilitated the growth in both sets of seeds. And this inspired me to uh, return to music because if plants could be so responsive to, to such beautiful sounds, um, then it, this implied that there was something even universal about melody and harmony and the beauty of the organization of sound and music that could be relevant to all of life.